Hello again. Welcome to chapter 25, and this is all about cardiac arrhythmias. So this is where we're going to look at EKGs, uh, tell you the things that you absolutely must know, uh, and we'll talk about a flutter, a fib, PVCs, VTAC, and VFib. Okay. All right. So by the time we are done, you're going to learn about the electrical activity of the heart, which you should already know. Okay. How we look at a rhythm strip, right? And what treatments we use for these different types of arrhythmias. The word arrhythmia and dysrhythmia. So technically, the dysrhythmia means that the rhythm is wrong. It's not a regular rhythm. And I know that even when we see A or AN at the beginning of a word, it typically means without. So without rhythm, arrhythmia, dysrhythmia, they basically are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. They mean the rhythm is not regular. Sounds like a jazz band sometimes, okay? Uh, we will talk about pacemakers and implanted cardioverting uh, defibrillation devices and post-op care for those patients as well. And so let's get going. You guys should know this. Remember, this is one of the three things that I told you you absolutely need to know. So the conduction system of the heart, you have the SA node, the sinoatrial node, 60 to 100 beats a minute. The atrioventricular node beats 40 to 60. And the bundle of his, which leads to the right and left bundle branches and Purkinje fibers, that's 20 to 40 beats per minute. So the sinoatrial node is called the pacemaker of the heart. That is the one that keeps that heart rate at 60 to 100 beats a minute, which is considered within normal limits. If it should fail, if something should go wrong, the AV node can kick in, but 40 to 60 beats a minute. And if something goes wrong with the AV node, then the bundle of his can kick in, but now you're looking at 20 to 40 beats per minute, which is not enough to perfuse. In other words, that's not enough beats a minute to get sufficient quantities of oxygenated blood to the brain and the organs and everywhere that you need it, okay? There's a representation of the um, conduction system on slide five, but I also gave you guys some cheat sheets already. Cardiac cycle is one heartbeat, one lub dub, okay? And when we look at an EKG strip, each of the little cycles that we see there is an electrical representation of the atria and the ventricles when they contract and relax, contract and relax. When they contract, push the blood out. When they relax, they fill back up. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, right? That's a lub dub. On slide seven, you will see what you need to see if it is a normal lub dub, the components necessary for one cardiac cycle. There should be a P wave and then Q, R, S, and then a T. All of those things need to be present for, for a, a heart rate and rhythm to be normal or within normal limits, okay? So just remember, there should be a P wave, QRS, and then a T. So when we look at an EKG, we're looking basically at the electrical activity of the heart. You typically would do a 12 lead, okay? So it's looking at the heart, the electrical activity of the heart from 12 different views, above it on the right, above it on the left, below it on the right, below it on the left, from posterior angle, posterior this angle, anterior. So it's 12 views. And when you look at that whole um, EKG, you'll see that the waveforms look a little bit different in each of the different leads. But lead two is the only one that we're going to be concerned with. Because when we look at Holter monitors or event monitors, uh, lead two is the one that is used. So that's the one that we are typically looking at. It's the most common, okay? When you look at the graph paper that the EKG is printed on, it's a grid. It's grid paper, and it's calibrated for measurement because the measurements are representations of time in seconds. So you've got itty-bitty tiny little squares, and they're 0 0.04 seconds, and then five of them, so 5 times 0 0.04 would be 0 0.2, right? So they're 0 0.2 seconds wide. And then amplitude, I'm just going to tell you, but don't worry about it, is the vertical measurement of, of the waves. So there's a nice piece of, of EKG graph paper, and you can see the little boxes and what they represent, okay? And we already talked about the components of the cycle that need to be present for it to be normal. There's got to be a P wave. 
The P wave represents the atria, okay, depolarization of the atria. And then we measure a PR interval. It's the beginning of the P to the beginning of the QRS complex. And you need to know that it's 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. See, I put stars after that number. You need to know the PR interval. It's an ATI question and it's a potential NCLEX question. So the PR interval is 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. And then there's a nice representation of the PR interval and how we measure it on the graph paper. Next, we have the QRS complex. So it's a combination of a Q wave, an R wave, and an S wave. It should always come after the P wave, and it's all about the ventricles, right? All about the ventricles. So the P wave is all about the atria, and then the QRS is all about the ventricles. We have what's called a QRS complex. So the QRS complex is those three, the Q, the R, and the S together. But then what we measure is the QRS interval. So if you look at slide 14, the QRS interval is the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the QRS complex. And that should be less than or equal to 0 0.10 seconds. Okay. And then there's a representation of the QRS interval. And then last but not least at all is the T wave. So the T wave is the very last little bump that you see. And that represents the ventricles repolarizing. In other words, now they're, they're filling back up and getting ready to do it again. And it should always be after the QRS complex. Okay. And then slide 17 shows T wave with a positive deflection and a T wave with an inverted or negative deflection. See, everything we look at when we look at an EKG tells us something. And when we're looking at lead two, it should look like the very the first one on slide 17. In other words, the T wave should be an upward bump. If we look at it and the T wave is a downward or negative deflection, that means that there's some kind of ischemia happening. Nothing that you need to know, but it's a fun fact. Right? So the QT interval is the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. Don't, you don't need to know that number, but I'm just telling you. It's 0.34 to 0.43, which to me is kind of easy to remember, 34 to 43. And it can vary because of gender, because of heart rate, because of age. But if it's prolonged or if it's super short, then that can be a warning sign to a lethal ventricular arrhythmia. So in other words, you know, sometimes you, the EKG will give us a warning sign. No, they haven't had a heart attack, but they might have one soon. Okay. And then we have the ST segment, which is the end of the QRS complex to the beginning of the T wave. And you'll see that on slide 20. And then when you look at 21, ST segment inverted. When you see that ST segment is down, it's depressed in lead two. So ST, there's a STEMI and there's a non-STEMI. So here we have an ST inversion. So it's a non-elevation. That's a sign of an MI. And then on slide 22, you see ST segment elevated. In other words, ST elevation MI. So that's also a sign of a heart attack. It's a STEMI or a non-STEMI. You'll hear that or you'll read that in a patient's chart. The way we interpret a rhythm, it's a six-step process. Is it regular? What's the rate? Is there a P wave? What's the PR interval? QRS interval and the QT interval. Okay. So again, the things that you need to be able to know, you need to recognize a normal sinus rhythm so that when you look at an EKG, I'm not going to ask you any hard questions about varying degrees of atrioventricular blocks, but you should be able to look at slide 24 and with just an eyeball at the slide, see all those QRS complexes look the same distance apart. So your brain can go, oh, that, that heart rate looks regular right? Because they're equal distances apart. Love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, right? And then you can calculate the rate by counting the boxes, right? Even if it's an irregular rhythm, you can calculate the rate. But here, I want you to just look at slide 27. And that is a nice, beautiful lead to normal sinus rhythm. Every complex has a P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. Love dub, Lub dub, lub dub, and they're about the same equal distance apart. Okay, so normal sinus rhythm, it's got to be a regular rhythm. 
the rate's got to be 60 to 100, and you must have those components. You got to have a P wave before every QRS. The PR interval has got to be 12 to 20, and the QRS should be less than 10. Okay. Now, if there's a problem when something goes wrong, you can have sinus brady or sinus tacky, which means that there is an arrhythmia or dysrhythmia happening where it's too slow, brady, too fast, tacky. And when you look at the EKG, do you see on slide 30 how far apart the complexes are from each other? Still regular. Lub dub. Lub dub. Dub, slow but regular. It's sinus brady. Okay. In order for it to be sinus brady, it's got to have a regular rhythm, but it's going to have a rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Okay. And really, that's all you need to know. When somebody's heart rate is that slow, they're going to sometimes not have symptoms, but if it gets too slow, they can be symptomatic. So, how slow is too slow? Just keep in mind, 60 to 100 is considered normal. People that are athletic, and I think I told you this before, people like, you know, Olympic swimmers like Michael Phelps will have a resting heart rate in the low 40s, but he is in tip-top shape cardiovascularly. So that, that rate of 40 or 42 for him is enough to perfuse him. If I had a heart rate of 40 or 42, I would probably be dizzy or I might faint, okay? Um, and what would you use? You could, would give me oxygen because I'm not getting enough oxygen. A drug called atropine that will speed my heart rate up. And then pacing. Pace, in other words, a pacemaker. Okay. Sinus tack. Same principle. Sinus, so it's regular, but now it's fast. See how close together on slide 33? The QRS complexes are smushed real tight together. But there's still a P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave for every cardiac cycle. So it's a, a, a normal rhythm, but it's too fast. Sinus tap. So you're going to have a regular rhythm, but now it's going to be fast 101 to about 180 beats per minute. You're still going to have your P waves, PR interval, and QRS interval. Okay, But with sinus tack, depending on how fast, they may have no symptoms. They may have chest pain or shortness of breath. And then the question is, why? Why is it going so fast? And so we would treat the cause. Um, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, they slow the heart rate down. Okay. A flutter and A fib. So the atria, these are atrial arrhythmias. They will not kill you, okay? but they are problematic, but they won't kill you. A flutter, you will see on slide 37, the, the, the P waves you'll start to see, looks like a little flutter. So there's a bunch of them before a QRS complex, okay? I'm not too concerned with that one, but you can recognize it. Looks very different than a normal sinus rhythm. So there's going to be a normal atrial rhythm, regular, but then the heart rate could be all over the place, right? And it looks like a sawtooth. You can't measure the PR interval because you're not sure there's five, six, seven, eight, nine P's, 10 P's, right? Okay. And signs and symptoms. Well, usually the ventricles are still beating at a normal rate. If that's the case, then they're not going to even know that they're having a flutter. But if the ventricles look at their upstairs neighbors, the atria, and go, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you're going really fast. We're going to now try to keep up. That's a rapid ventricular response, RVR. So now, because the ventricles are going to start speeding up to try to keep up with what the atria are doing, now the patient's probably going to have what feels like chest palpitations, angina, shortness of breath, this new. Okay. What do we do? We can do cardioversion. Cardioversion is voluntary defibrillation. You heard me. Voluntarily. We're just going to, we're going to take your heart, and because it's going crazy, we're going to slap it and go snap out of it. And sometimes that does the trick. We can do a pacemaker. We can use calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, you know, as far as medication. So we can do an ablation. The word ablation means destroy. So with an ablation, we physically invasively go in and wherever that bad rhythm is coming from, we just destroy that part of the myocardium. And believe it or not, it's a very successful procedure. Okay. 
AFib, which is very common, um, is kind of like a flutter, but to a higher degree. The way I always describe fibrillation is if you look at a bowl of jello. If you have a blob of jello sitting in a bowl, when you shake the bowl, the jello goes. Right? So when the heart is fibrillating, it's basically what it's doing. It's just going when it's supposed to be going. Okay. When it's doing this, it can't pump, right? Because it can't fill and it can't empty. It's not, so it's just blah, 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 blah. The big problem with AFib is the development of blood clots in the atria. Because when blood sits, blood clots, right? So if you look at 41, you'll see um, atrial fibrillation. And you'll see that there's not even anything discernible. It's Because right? the atria, the P waves aren't really, you can't really make them out. They're not identifiable, but it's usually irregularly irregular. And just to clarify, in other words, sometimes an irregular beat can have regularity to it. So in other words, let's say every third beat, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, dub dub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, dub dub dub. That's regularly irregular. So it's got its own rhythm, but it's not right. Irregularly irregular is just all over the place. Lub dub, lub dub, dub 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 dub, lub, lub dub, lub, lub dub, lub dub, dub 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 dub, dub, lub dub. See, just all over the place. So AFib is irregularly irregular. It's all over the place. You cannot measure the atrial rate at all because you really can't identify the P waves because they're just okay and with a fib usually sometimes patients won't have signs and symptoms but if it is sustained for a period of time they will sometimes feel like I feel like my heart is going to jump out of my chest palpitations when you go to check their radial pulse you may not even get one okay you may you may not and when when you listen it may be very difficult for you to try to count a rate because you may be hearing the hard to count. What do we do? If AFib comes and goes, if it's intermittent, paroxysmal AFib, we can usually treat with medications, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, DIG, DIG is one of the faves. If and also anticoagulants, by the way. So we're always going to give them anticoagulants because when they do have those, those episodes of fibrillation and the blood sits in the atria because the atria, blah, 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 we don't want a clot to form, right? So we'll have them on anticoags. But if the AFib is sustained for a period of time, it can be a problem. And so sometimes we have to do things invasively like an ablation or a, it's called a maze procedure, which is an ablation procedure. We destroy part of that tissue that's where, where that weird rhythm is coming from. And then we have ventricular dysrhythmias. We'll talk about these real quickly. So PVCs, I'm not going to get into detail about PVCs. With a PVC, it's a premature ventricular contraction. What's supposed to happen is the atria go first and then the ventricles. Sometimes the ventricles get ahead of themselves and they want to go first before the atria. So they're premature. Okay. Um, in and of themselves, PVCs aren't a problem. Um, people can have PVCs because of too much caffeine, too much nicotine, um, you know, stress, those kinds of things, lack of sleep. And they can be just kind of like intermittent and occasional. Okay? Uh, but if PVCs, if there's a run in other words, lots of them in a row, well, that can be a problem because now you're not getting adequate perfusion because the ventricles are kind of doing their own thing aside from what the atria are doing, okay? So I know slide 46 gets into unifocal and multifocal. Don't worry about that. Um, you don't need to know that. But understand that with a PVC, the rhythm is immediately interrupted. And the heart rate, you know, sometimes is hard to get. You won't see a P wave because the atria didn't get a chance to do their thing. The ventricles jumped in too quickly. So there's no PR wave. There's no P wave. There's no PR interval. And you will see a QRS interval, but it's going to be greater than 10 seconds. Okay. 
And again, you know, there are names. You look at slide 48. You don't need to know this, but there's bigeminy, trigeminy, quadrigeminy. There's couplets. Bigeminy is two PBCs every other beat or a PVC every other beat, a PVC every third beat is trigeminy, a PVC every fourth beat is quadrigeminy. You don't need to know that, but they're fun words, okay? And then there's um, a, a, a strip on slide 49 that you can look at. So, like I said, with PVCs, they're usually harmless. If they are, if they're in runs, then we can use medications like beta blockers, okay? But now here's the big gun that I want to talk about, VTAC and VFib, because these are the ones that are lethal, dysrhythmias. They will kill you. Ventricular tachycardia, slide 51. What is it? Neeny, 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 right? The ventricles are going so fast that there is not a discernible anything. So usually it's regular. Like if you look at that strip, those, those, what look like QRSs are the same distance apart, right? But it's just the ventricles are going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So there's a regular rhythm, but the heart rate is fast. The ventricles are moving about 150 to 250 ventricular beats per minute. Not going to see a P wave because the ventricles are going so fast. The atria can't do anything. There's no PR interval, and the QRS interval is going to be way greater than 10 seconds. And with VTAC, the patient is symptomatic because your ventricles are the ones, your left ventricle is supposed to pump oxygenated blood to your body, your brain, your tissues, your organs, and then your right ventricle is supposed to be pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs, but neither of them are doing anything except blah, 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 right, so fast, this patient's going to be short of breath, they may be feeling palpitations, lightheadedness, but really, they're typically pulseless, so if you get a pulse, or you go to try to obtain a pulse, you probably won't feel one because they're going so fast they can't pump. So there's not a pulse. Okay, this is what leads to cardiac arrest. Okay, or MI, heart attack. If they're pulseless, well, we're doing CPR and defibrillating them. If they have VTAC, that I'll, I'll mention this, that's stable, which is unusual, but it does occur. We can give an antiarrhythmic. So in other words, once in a while they go into a VTAC only for a short period of time. And the rate only goes up to about 150, 160 beats a minute. Not that, you know, but usually with VTAC, they're pulseless and they need CPR and defibrillation. And then VTAC will lead to VFib, ventricular fibrillation, which is slide 55. And you can see, basically, there's nothing going on because the ventricles are just quivering. They're not pumping, right, at all. And the, the rhythm... Now, instead of being regular like it was with the VTAC, it's just, there's no rhythm. It's chaos, just mad chaos. You cannot measure a heart rate. There are no P waves for you to see. There's no PR interval. There's no QRS interval. The patient is unconscious. When you put your, your stethoscope to auscultate their heart, you're not going to hear anything. Typically, respiratory arrest is going to follow. The patient's going to be cyanotic. Their pupils are probably going to be dilated and fixed. They need a CLS. So they need to be defibrillated immediately or if you're not in that kind of an environment, CPR, compressions, right? And then we give drugs like epinephrine, amiodarone, lidocaine. Usually the patient's going to get intubated and oxygenated that way if they're in a facility. But if we do all that and none of it works, what happens is slide 59. A- systole. They call it flatlining. Basically, there's nothing. The heart has just said, I'm done. I quit. So there's no rhythm. There's no rate. There's no P wave. There's no QRS. There's nothing. There's nothing happening. So basically, patient's dead. Okay. All right. So that's it for the rhythms. Now, pacemakers. What's a pacemaker? A pacemaker is an electric device that we implant inside the body but there are also external pacemakers. But either way, they are generating an impulse where the heart is not able to do it. And so they're just basically going, all right, I'm set at 58 beats a minute. You're not beating. Eh, beat. And the pacemaker senses that it's not, the heart's not beating, and then jolts a little bit of electricity, boom, to jumpstart the heart and make it beat. Um, 
if a patient comes into the emergency room with severe bradycardia, for whatever reason, we can put an external pacemaker on them where we're, it's temporary, um, but we're putting something on their chest externally that is going to sense and then just give a little jolt, a little jolt of electricity. Beat, come on, beat, come on, beat. Internal, they're the permanent pacemakers. They're the ones that we surgically implant inside the patient. And they can have wires, also called leads, going to the atria, the ventricles, or both. It depends on what kind of arrhythmia the patient has. And when you look at an EKG for a patient that has a pacer, you're going to see a spike, just a straight, solid black line wherever the pacer is pacing. Okay. Um, if you look at the slide 63, that's a dual chamber pacemaker. In other words, it's got leads to the atria and leads to the ventricles. And then if you look at slide 64, slide or, or picture A is an atrial only pacemaker. So you see this spike right before each P wave. So the pacer is saying atria, beat, atria, beat, atria, beat. See? And then ventricular only is B, and that's where you see the pacemaker spike before each QRS. So the atria, lob, nothing's happening. So the pacemaker's going, do your dub, beat, lob, boom, dub, lob, boom, dub, lob, boom, dub. Pacemaker's kicking in. That's the spike to make the ventricles beat. And then dual chamber, patient's got problems. They have problems atrial and ventricular. So you're going to have a spike before the P and a spike before the QRS because the pacer's got to go atrial love, ventricles dub, atrial love, ventricles dub. Okay? It's that simple. Postoperatively, the patient typically is going to have an incisional site at the left anterior chest wall. It's usually covered with uh, like a new skin crazy glue and steri strips when they go home. Um, they can shower. The steri strips will slough off on their own. You're going to be looking for signs and symptoms of infection as always. Activity restrictions. Make sure you understand no lifting anything greater than five pounds. And they cannot lift their arms above their head because when if they do this, what they can do is dislodge the wires of the pacemaker, usually for about the first six weeks or so. Um, and also, they're going to always carry an ID card that says what kind of pacer they have, et cetera, et cetera, you know, on their person at all times. And they're going to be having regular periodic pacemaker checks done. It used to be that they couldn't have microwaves or be near microwaves. Well, they can now. Okay. Security devices. If you go to an airport, right, um, they, they can be a trigger. The walkthrough ones aren't so bad, but the ones where they take the wand and run it over your body, they can't use those. They cannot go into an MRI. They can't go to radio towers and they can't go anywhere near a running car engine <laughs> because there's electrical activity in there. Okay. So, and then we have defibrillation and defibrillation is basically a big jolt of electrical energy to snap the heart out of fibrillation. It's defibrillation. Okay. We use it for pulseless VTAC and VFib. Basically, there are pads with paddles go on the chest and second intercostal space at the right side of the sternum and the anterior axillary line at the fifth intercostal space. There's going to be a picture in a second. And before you shock the patient, you have to always yell clear because if there's usually other staff members. If anybody's touching the patient or touching the bed, when you hit them with the electric electricity, if they're touching the patient or the bed right there, that person will get shocked as well. And it's a lot of electricity, so you don't want to get shocked. There's a picture of where the paddles are supposed to be placed. Um, there are automated ones that you can find in shopping malls now. They're pretty much everywhere, where normally in a hospital, we're putting the EKG strips on you and we're reading the rhythm and we're deciding whether or not to defibrillate you and if we are, how much electricity we're using. An automated external defibrillator does that on its own. Okay. And then we have synchronized cardioversion, which usually is used for like a fib and a flutter. We sedate the patient a little bit. So it's like a conscious sedation and a little electricity, not as much as the paddles, but a good bit. And basically we're telling the heart, 
It's like if you have someone who's hysterical. You ever watch a movie where somebody, ah, and they're screaming and somebody else goes, slap out of it, right? They slap them in the face. That's what cardioversion is. We are cardio birding. We're converting your rhythm back to normal. So sometimes it's like a slap to the heart. Boom, act right. And the heart will convert to a normal sinus rhythm. Synchronized cardioversion. Talked about the um, automa automatic external defibrillator, like in the malls and stuff. And then you can have one that's implantable. So in other words, people that have had histories of, you know, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, they will have a defibrillator implanted in their chest. And if they should go into one of these lethal rhythms, it's going to shock them. And they're going to feel it. And it's going to hurt. Okay. Because it's going to bam hit them with a big jolt of electricity. Okay. There's a picture on slide 72 of a cardioverter device that's inside. Okay. And that's it. Just make sure you know the things that I highlighted as far as knowing what a normal EKG looks like, what's the component of an EKG. It should have a P wave, QRS complex, T wave, etc. They're the things you need to know. Um, and the numbers that we went over as far as the, um, the PR interval and um, QRS or QT complex, okay? And that's really about it. Make sure you can look at, you know, the difference between a normal sinus rhythm and a fib, a flutter, VTAC, and VFib, which are pretty easy to distinguish. And post-op care of the pacemaker patient, okay? That's all for now. Next time, peace. See you later.